Okay. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Stephen Laporte. Um, I work for the Wikimedia Foundation legal team, and I'm here to talk about free and open source software licensing. Um, the purpose of this talk is to provide a general introduction to open source. Um, if you work here, you're probably very familiar with how open source works, and you probably are very familiar with the licenses, um, as well as the technical side. Uh, so um, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail, but feel free to ask questions. Um, also, uh, I work on the legal team. I'm happy to advise uh, the members of the Wikimedia Foundation engineering team. So if you have really specific questions about projects you're working on, it's probably best for us to discuss those afterwards. Um, and I think I'll have a little bit of time for general questions at the end. Um, Two notes. Uh, I have a copy of this presentation um, with more complete uh, details on what I'm presenting. So if you'd like to refer to that afterwards, uh, let me know. And uh, second, uh, in the spirit of free culture and uh, the, the Creative Commons licenses we use on all of our projects, um, all of the, the license, all of the images uh, throughout this presentation, as well as the presentation itself, um, are freely licensed. Um, this presentation is a remix and. Uh, uh, including a lot of work that Lewis prepared and Lewis and I presented previously. Uh, so you'll find attributions at the end of the deck uh, with more information about where you can, you can find details on that. So a note on uh, terminology. Uh, you'll see the words free uh, software and open source licensing used around the internet uh, largely interchangeably, um, but they are actually very different terms. They come from different historical and philosophical backgrounds. Uh, there's, a, there's a bit of an ideological or linguistic war that goes on between free and open source software. Uh, but they, we'll use them roughly to mean the same thing here, uh, they, but they are different. Uh, I won't go into the details of, of the differences. Uh, a lot of what we do qualifies as free software, but we also use a lot of open source software licenses. Um, and uh, a lot, there's you know, some, some arguments about where exactly the difference lies. Uh, this presentation is designed to be largely pragmatic, so uh, to avoid uh, falling into the, the, the war between free and open source software, we're just going to refer to them collectively as free open source software, or FOSS. Uh, you might also see the phrase free licensing and, or free Libra open source software, uh, FLOSS, around the internet, um, but we'll just be pragmatic about the terms we use. So, uh, why do we use open source so extensively at Wikimedia, around the office, um, and in all of our projects? Um, if you're hired you know, as an engineer working for Wikimedia, you probably have a, a gut reaction to that, um, and you probably also understand a lot of the arguments for free software. But it's important to, to vis revisit them uh, just so we can inform um, our discussion of how we comply with, with free licenses. Uh, because exactly how we use them um, is largely motivated by why they're good for our organization. So first and foremost, uh, the Wikimedia Foundation is a public charity. We're a nonprofit organization, uh, and our mission includes a dedication to developing content under a free license. So we simply use free software licenses and uh, open source licenses because we say we are it's part of our core mission. Um, and uh, we develop all of our materials, not just the photos and text, but all of the, also the software and tools under licenses that allow others to use what we create and then we build upon it. Uh, that's just how we do things in the community. Second, uh, we have a community of people that, that work on open source software and this community uh, contributes back to our work um, and they're able to participate uh, in our work because we're so open. So uh, by, by using open source and uh, free software, uh, we develop a healthier community and we sort of grow that community. Um, and I, I think if you look at the community on MediaWiki.org, you'll see one of the more cooperative uh, and productive communities that, that we have. And then finally, uh, we use open source and free software because basically it works. It does, um, it does great things. Um, you probably already know that. That's probably why we work here. <laughs> so, uh, we, so that means we comply with open source uh, obligations, both as a legal matter um, as well as a, as a moral one. Uh, the bottom line is that we're legally required to comply with these licenses, but it's also the right thing and it helps our, it helps our software improve and our community grow. So I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna walk through some of our uh, licensing obligations. Uh, I'll talk about some of the categories of licenses 
and then uh, the different obligations they have, as, as well as some examples. Uh, these categories are, are rough categories. I think you'll find them around the internet. A lot of people use them, but they're, they're not necessarily set in stone, so uh, you, you might uh, see some differences if you go uh, to the Wikipedia articles and all of those places. So in general, um, they fall into three categories. All open source licenses allow people to use, uh, modify, and share work. Uh, we use the list of licenses that's prepared by OSI. If you look at our contracts, you'll see the phrase OSI approved licenses. Uh, but there are other lists of what qualifies as a, uh, as a free or open source license. The Free Software Foundation publishes one of these lists. If you see anything that doesn't, uh, that isn't on the OSI list or the Free Software Foundation's list, uh, I wouldn't recommend using it. Uh, that's usually a big warning flag, mostly that uh, people are confused about what they're doing or perhaps they are not actually releasing it under a free license. Uh, but if you have concerns about an acronym that you see, uh, come talk to the legal team and uh, we can help you figure out if it actually is an open source license. Uh, but the list is pretty comprehensive. It's probably longer than you need. You don't need to know every single one of the acronyms on there. Uh, but the OSI list is one I point you to. And then uh, the, the three categories that we'll discuss today, and I think you can probably group all of the, the open source licenses into one of these categories. And there, there are, of course, nuances within them. But uh, these categories are a useful way to thinking, of thinking about it. Um, the first is uh, permissive licenses. This, these are designed for simplicity, which basically you want to get your, your software out there. The second are copyleft licenses. Uh, these are designed to promote freedom, to ensure that stuff stays free and open source. And then finally, the uh, Faro uh, category, which basically consists of one license. And that's designed to really, really promote freedom, especially in a world that has uh, web services. Um, so uh, all of these licenses are very similar. They allow you to use, modify, and share. But they have different obligations exactly uh, when you use or share uh, the software. So we'll discuss some of those. The first, the permissive licenses. Uh, permissive licenses uh, allow you to do anything, um, including sharing uh, copies of the binary code without sharing copies of the source code. Uh, they are very popular. Um, they're increasingly popular these days. They are just basically designed for simplicity. Uh, why would you want to use an open, uh, a permissive license? Uh, basically, it's something that you just want to get out there, and uh, you don't want to attach any additional conditions. Um, they have very minimal strings attached, and we'll discuss what those exactly are. So um, there's really only two things you need to think about when you're using a permissive license. Um, first, if uh, you give someone a copy of the code, then you have to share a copy of the license uh, in the license file. And then second, if you, if you do share a copy of the code, you shouldn't change any of the, the licensing text to claim that you wrote it. You have to keep the original um, credit or attribution in place. Um, exactly how this works is different from license to license, but basically if you follow those two key obligations, uh, you'll be on the clear. Um, and of course, you know, I'm happy to discuss if you have questions about particular licenses. Um, these obligations occur when you distribute the, uh, the when you distribute the code. Uh, so uh, we'll discuss how that works with a few examples. The common permissive licenses um, include the BSD MIT license, um, as well as Apache. We use Apache for mobile apps. Um, it's sort of our recommended license, but there are you know, others you can use. Um, if you see a new one and you're not sure exactly how it fits, because there are, there are much more than these three that we can discuss, but there are also benefits to sort of sticking to a few standard licenses, but just using Apache as many times as you can. So um, what do you do if you distribute a, a piece of binary code, like, uh, like, a, like a mobile app, under a permissive license? Um, the answer is pretty simple. Uh, all we're required to do is include licensing information inside of the application. Um, this is something that we do already. If you look inside of the Wikipedia mobile app, you'll see a list of libraries used uh, with links to the license, and that material is readily available for people um, who, uh, who use the app. Um, you'll find this all over many other apps as well. And uh, we actually go above and beyond. We distribute copies of the source code. Um, but that's not one of the things you're required to do um, under a permissive license. We just do that because uh, we sort of go above and beyond in this space. 
So uh, what happens if you use uh, a permissive license on uh, in the side of a service where you're not actually distributing the, the binary source code, but you're just using it, uh, perhaps, you know, to run some software? Um, th this is even simpler because when you're not distributing a permissive license, the obligations don't come into effect. This is part of uh, why people like permissive licenses. They're just very easy to, to, to use um, without really thinking about what the license uh, about what the license requires of you. So there, there are two exceptions that you that you need to always keep in mind. Um, if you do share source code, you should always always preserve the licensing information. Um, and if we uh, you know if we do go above and beyond like we do inside of the, uh, the Wikipedia mobile app, uh, this is an important thing to keep in mind. And then second, if you're putting the source code into Debian packages or other you know, distributed repositories, uh, you might be required to include correct licensing information. Um, and there are tools that can help you catch this sort of uh, this sort of compliance. The second category of licenses are the copyleft licenses. Uh, copyleft is different than permissive. It, as I said before, it's designed to protect freedom. Um, in a nutshell, copyright licenses allow you to use and modify, but if you share binaries built upon the source code, then there are some additional uh, obligations that go into effect. Uh, you have to share a copy of the, uh, the source code, and you also have to release the, the code that you have uh, incorporated it into under the same license. Um, this is sometimes called a viral clause. Um, a better term might be reciprocal or hereditary. Um, but the key is that you have to give the code under the same license that uh, you got it under, and that is how it protects freedom. It ensures things are not locked up by someone who's um, contributing modifications to your code. So in our context, we usually use the GNU General Public License, or the GPL. Um, it's far away the most common uh, viral or copyleft license that you'll see, and it's uh, widely used for MediaWiki, our software, but many other pieces of software as well. Um, for our purposes, we use the GPL version 2. Um, GPL version 2 and v3 are very similar, um, but they are different licenses, uh, so we should keep that in mind. Uh, when we label things for, for Wikimedia's purpose, we use uh, GPL v2 or any later version. That doesn't mean you know, if we put v3 on there, it means we put the phrase any later version on our code. Uh, and that's just a, a standard practice that people do with uh, uh, GPL software. So what do we do if we include a GPL license library inside of, the, inside of a, an application that we distribute in binary form? Uh, this is similar to the, the first example under the permissive licenses. But the outcome is slightly different. With the copyleft license, we're required to include the license in the app, which is the same as permissive, but we're also required to make the source code available to users and then also under the same license. So that is a, an additional uh, requirement that is uh, sometimes burdensome for people. So uh, one question that you're probably wondering is what must you make under the GPL? What does this viral clause actually apply to? Um, so if you're including the GPL code inside of the code of the Wikipedia app, then um, the answer is more clear cut. But if it's a separate library that's being incorporated in there, the answer can get a little bit tricky. Um, I would recommend talking with the legal team to understand exactly how this uh, works. Uh, if you have any questions about combining um, the GPL with other licenses, then we probably need to discuss how the combination is being made in order to determine if uh, the viral clause is, is coming into effect. So what happens if you're using uh, GPL license libraries on our server? Uh, the second example under the permissive licenses, um, and similarly to the permissive licenses, there is no obligation uh, because we're not distributing the code to our users in binary form. We're merely using the, uh, the code. Now, there are uh, two exceptions, as we discussed before. When we do publish the code, we have to maintain the licensing information. And if we're distributing this in a Debian package, then we have to comply with those rules as well. Um, but uh, for the most part, using the code doesn't trigger the, uh, the license compliance. The Afero license is not technically a new license, uh, but it's one that's becoming really more popular. Uh, in the age of web services, it goes above and beyond what the, uh, the GPL requires. So uh, this is the, the last category of license, and it consists largely of one, which is the, the Afero uh, general public license, or the AGPL. Um, 
the AGPO requires you to distribute code, even if you haven't uh, distributed the binary version, if you're using it um, to create an interactive service that users can access over the web. So essentially, if you're using something like MediaWiki as a web service, then you would need to also distribute, uh, comply with the obligations under the license. Uh, this is very different than traditional open source licenses, but it's designed to ensure that we can protect freedom in sort of a GPL style um, in an era when people don't often distribute code but just run them as services. So if we're using uh, an AGPL license library on a server which is user facing where users actually interact with that library, we're required to make the source code available and then uh, possibly that requirement extends to the AGPL. Um, so this requirement is, is rather big. It means a lot, uh, very few people actually use the AGPL. There are some notable services that do, but uh, it's not as common as the GPL. Um, the GPL was sort of designed with Linux and GCC in mind, and the AGPL was designed with web services in mind. Uh, but the just changes in, in licensing has meant more things end up permissive than under something like the AGPL. But um, if we're looking to sort of protect freedom and be aggressive about that uh, with a web service, then the AGPL might be a choice to consider. Uh, there's some open questions, just like the GPL, of exactly what source code you're required to release. But unlike the GPL, we don't have a lot of industry practice around it since it's a, it's a you know, newer license and not as widely used. Uh, the legal department has sort of a checklist that we can help you uh, walk through if you're considering using uh, the AGPL or if, you're, uh, if you want to release some software you've created under the AGPL. Uh, but the standards are uh, sort of un unclear. We also have an additional new question, what is user-facing code or code that users interact with? Um, so that will, that, you know, that means that not necessarily everything we run on our servers that's released AGPL would trigger the AGPL requirements. Uh, but it, this, is, this is sort of a, a, a complication that we can work out together. So in summary, um, basically three things to keep in mind. Always include licensing information when you distribute code. Uh, if you're using a uh, copyleft license in mobile uh, need, or distributing the binary, then you need to consider it uh, in a little more detail. And then be extra careful if you see the eGPL anywhere um, and discuss with us if you think it might be appropriate. I have a few additional points um, on top of this um, besides those three that we just discussed. So first, um, Always keep track of where you get your code. Uh, many developers uh, don't think about it, but just because you know you see it as under an open license doesn't mean it's it's free to be used in any way at all. Um, if you're copying and pasting random code from around the internet, uh, you might end up with uh, licenses that are incompatible. Um, one notable example is uh, Stack Overflow, which uses Creative Commons uh, 3.0 for their uh, their license uh, with a share alike clause that can have some complications when using it with GPL. Um, so please avoid copying and pasting code blindly from uh, Stack Overflow into GPL license code. Uh, if you have questions about where code came from, perhaps it's released on another license that is compatible with the GPL, since things might have had an you know, original repository other than Stack Overflow. But the the Open Source there. Initiative is trying to get that fixed, actually. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Not going to look like the incompatibility? Or the... No, trying to get Stack Overflow to fix the license for their oh, code. Oh, yes, because using CC by safe for code is stupid. What organization would possibly do that, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so we have, uh, yes, and uh, Creative Commons oh. has worked hard to get uh, CC by SA 4.0. Um, compatible with the GPL, but uh, exactly how that will help uh, o Stack only, Overflow? Only GPL v3, Greg. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> and yeah, uh, so the, the, just status quo, be careful if you're copying and pasting here. But in general, it's good to know where your code came from, even if it's not from Stack Overflow, uh, because that can help us track down who created it. Um, and in practice, people who release their stuff on Stack Overflow or elsewhere want their code to be used by others, and being used by Wikimedia is awesome. So uh, we can talk to them about getting them to use a, the right license if you have any of that. Um, so uh, be careful about incompatible licenses. As I said before, just because it's free doesn't mean that it is free without conditions, and sometimes those conditions don't match up easily. Uh, so uh, there are sometimes some mixing and matching problems. Uh, here are a few of the most common ones. Uh, but if you're ever in doubt, come talk to the legal team. We can, we can help you sort it out and basically make it so you don't have to worry about it. Um, 
we, it's really helpful to use consistent licenses to avoid this sort of mix and match problem. Um, so uh, we recommend that you use the GPL v2 or later for uh, MediaWiki's standard uh, work. Um, this helps ensure that uh, we use the same license, we're on the same page, and we avoid unintentional sort of mixing and matching problems with compatibility questions. Um, if you're creating extensions or you know, other scripts to do things, a permissive license might make more sense. But if you're contributing to MediaWiki core or MediaWiki extensions, then uh, GPL v2 is a great standard. Um, another uh, really important point is to ensure you have a license uh, header and a file in all of your code. It not only helps us keep track of the licenses that we use and the obligations that we have, but it also helps others um, comply with the licenses that we're giving them. Basically, we should make it easy for them to understand what their obligations are. So uh, in practice, the uh, licensing files can get separated from the code that they're attached to. So um, using a consistent licensing practice can uh, be very helpful. Um, the best way to do this is to liberally include a license file in your repository, in the top level directory, and then include brief headers and all of your source code to say what the file happens in. This pie chart is for media with core? Yes. So you're telling me that like only about just over a quarter of having a clear license header indicating that it's two billion plus. So this is based off of like an automated code scan. Okay. So it's possible that the automated code scan isn't picking up on like the standard practice that we're yeah, No, it's, it's possible that we also, it's likely that we don't follow the standard practice. I'm just surprised because the entire repository is supposed to be GPL V2 plus. It's supposed to be its policy. And yeah. And there, there are you know things that end up in there, like you know CSS files or JavaScript that yeah, has yeah. different licenses, right? And you're actually right. There's a thing sliver that's coded that is on my team, right? Yeah. So, uh, so using something, using a consistent practice can be a great way to kind of change that pie chart. And once we know what that practice is, we can build a you know, better scanning tool and then uh, you know, make sure that we have a pie chart that actually reflects what's going on inside of our practice. I mean, I did that with an open source uh, scanning tool. Oh, so yeah. we, uh, we can replicate that if, if we need to. And that is, and this, that, this pie chart doesn't have a date on it, but it's now two years old, so oh, it might be worth it. Yeah. Is it two years old? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. all right. Time passes. <laughs> yeah. So uh, the the Software Freedom Law Center uh, recommends this header standard. It's a little bit wordy, but I think it's a it's a good just uh, reference point as we think about what we want to do in our own source code. Um, so a few key things to note here. Really? Okay, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah. So uh, what this has is a reference to the top level directory where you can find the license file. So it doesn't actually mention the license in the header itself. It just says go here to find out what the license is. Which means uh, you know we can have this in every single file and uh, keep track of you know one license for the, the repository. That's all it has. It doesn't have um, a list of names. It just has a credits file. So we don't have to change all of these headers every single time there's a new license uh, or a new person contributing to it. Um, and again, uh, it keeps everything in one central license file. Uh, this makes it easier for programmers, but harder for code scanning tools. So if we do want to follow this uh, header consistently, then we need, to, uh, uh, we need to just keep that in mind and create our head charts. So this can be easy. Uh, there are Emacs extensions uh, or Emacs tools to, uh, to add this sort of thing in. Um, it's possible to have your ID collapse down the license header so you don't have to look at it all the time. It's just there for others who download the code. Um, and again, as I said before, it helps other people uh, know what we're using. Um, I think we've all had trouble when we found something awesome on GitHub that has an unclear license and we can't tell if we can use it or not. We don't want to put other people in the same difficult situation. Um, and then it can just make it easy for us to track uh, what we're doing and how we're complying. Um, and then finally, if you're ever asked to sign a CLA or contributor license agreement, uh, come talk to the legal team. These uh, We do sign these, um, but for a variety of reasons, they can be uh, they can be somewhat different. So uh, talk to talk to us before you do end up signing one. Uh, basically, these are tools that other projects use to keep track of everyone who has given them an open source license. Uh, they have a lot of uh, great advantages, but uh, we just want to make sure they're not they're not going above and beyond what they claim they're doing. So if you ever see a CLA or ask to sign one to contribute to something like HHBM, um, come talk to us to make sure it meets our stuff. And then finally, uh, you know, you have you have a legal team. Uh, we love to talk about open source licensing. 
um, both the history, the philosophy, as well as the, the practical, practical uh, impact on you. So uh, feel free to, to reach out to one of your lawyers um, or uh, even ex-lawyers because we love to talk about open source. <laughs> so some credits for the slides. Um, and I think I have a, a few questions. I'm happy to discuss if anyone has time. Um, um, so, like in OIT, we have some code on GitHub. It should be the generic license we put on GPL. Yeah, so. so like, we, we just put it out there, like, hey, anyone can use this. It's, it's our intention, like, can you use it? It's it, it like, isn't, it is not part of a larger project. It's just sort of your. Yeah, your like some scripts, scripts here and there. And then just yeah. be careful if we're um, using other things from GitHub, right? Like, if we had, like, a wrapper around and not another script that we include. License for that, right? Yeah, yeah. And when we're talking about just simple scripts, then I, yeah. I think a permissive license is, is usually best. Right, it's fine. Like yeah. this, like I think Joel put like the MIT one on there. It's just it's yeah, yeah. And, and uh, MIT, you know, works great. Uh, we we use Apache for a lot of our stuff. Uh, we can discuss some of the pros and cons of them. Uh, but the you know any any one of those three that I mentioned, Apache, BSD, MIT, I think probably better. Yeah. So there's a couple questions from IRC. Um, one is um, regarding CLAs. Does WMF have a page somewhere listing CLAs that have already been reviewed and the outcome? And I know S also has some questions too. And he's only hanging out. Yeah, I don't believe we have a page listing CLAs that we've signed, but um, we do have uh, records of them in the, the legal team. So if you uh, if you have one, come talk to us, and perhaps we can put together like just a general list of CLAs we look at. That's from Brian Davis. So. Okay. Go ahead, S. You're muted. Um, yeah, I, I was wondering about, um, can you talk about the so difference with the GPL and the AGPL? As I understand it, um, for the stuff we do, we could change to AGPL, but what would that, ha but presumably that would have an effect on other people deciding whether or not to use MediaWiki software. Yeah, so I guess there's really two questions there. So the, the first is, you know, just the difference between GPL and AGPL. Um, that, is a, uh, that, that is a matter of, of when we're, as I said before, when we're going to require people to comply with the terms of the license. So um, people don't often distribute uh, MediaWiki as, as a binary. They often just use it as a web service. So... Um, right now, the, the requirements of the GPL are not as uh, not as applicable, I guess, to most uses of MediaWiki. Um, and in, in putting it under the AGPL would increase the number of like uses that would require them to look at the license and then comply with the terms. So, uh, if we if we wanted to ensure that everyone making modifications to MediaWiki and running it for users. Uh, to interact with uh, was required to release those changes under the, the AGPL, then, um, then the AGPL is the license to use. It's sort of more aggressively pushing the, uh, the copyleft terms onto, onto our user base. Um, so that, that, I think, is an open question, and I think increasing the burden for users to comply with the license has pros and cons, right? It can help us get better code, but it can also decrease the number of people who use our software. Uh, I, it's some, something to discuss and consider, but uh, I don't think there's a like, clear-cut answer on whether or not it's good or bad. Um, the second question is, can we can we make the change from AGPL to GPL? So let's say we decide it's a good thing. Um, we have a license under the GPL from all of the contributors to MediaWiki, but that doesn't necessarily give us the power to, to change the license for the entire project um, historically. So we would need to, to have a conversation about how... Not, not only should we make the change, but how we make that change happen. Is it for the project going forward, or is it for you know, the existing contributors agreeing to a new license? Uh, but I, those, are, those are two, I think, relatively big questions. Um, and in, in my view, we want to see a pretty, pretty big uh, gain for the project, like um, pretty big advantage for the, the whole ecosystem uh, to make the switch. I know that Ed has another question. Uh, sure, I have tons, actually. Um, uh, the other one is for a piece of sample code. Um, 
uh, it sounds like it might be like, for example, the boilerplate expansion where you know we're saying we want people to use this. It sounds like it might be better to use a more per permissive license for that because we're encouraging people to use it. But uh, the second part of that is um, when you ex ex excerpt code, you kind of say, oh, here's a way to do, uh, I don't know, register an extension, and uh, I quote part of a, um, a licensed piece of software. Should I be sort of concerned about that, or is it, you know, is is the level of you know twenty lines of a function short enough not to worry about? Yeah. So I th th that is you know a, a question that doesn't have a super clear cut answer. But and you have just like you can quote a piece of text in your essay, you can quote a piece of code um, in your documentation without necessarily requiring permission from the authors, right? Like that that is something that's that's generally allowed under fair use. So I, you know, depending on what you're coding and how much you're coding it, you don't need to uh, you don't need to comply with the, the terms of the license. But uh, as I said before, compliance isn't just a matter of like the technicalities of you know what we're legally obligated to do. Providing a link back to uh, the code repository that the code came from and uh, giving credit to the authors as much as you can is a uh, is a good way to kind of inform your users about what's going on. So um, I think it's a it's a it's a very um, kind of it's a more fluid uh, answer than you probably want, but um, I'd recommend always you know linking back to the the repository uh, so that people have a way to find the license information. If they're really curious. Okay, Greg, have a question. Go ahead, Greg. Yeah, it's actually kind of a follow-on to uh, S's question, and I'm sorry for asking it. Um, <laughs> so. Um, Yesterday, I was looking at an issue where we have a couple extensions that are bundled in the tarball, and they have unclear licensing history. Not terrible licensing history, just not clear licensing history. Um, and the question that came in my head, which is one that I'm sure that you've thought about but don't want to give a real quick answer on, and you're free to say, let's talk more, is are all extensions to MediaWiki just by de facto GPL v2 to the MediaWiki core being GPL v2, given the tight integration between in extensions and core. Um, reason I ask is that would make this issue that I'm seeing clear cut and dry, you know, like not an issue. Yeah, um, I, I, think, I think that's something that we would probably want to, you know, talk a little bit more about. Um, I, but I, I, I do encourage you to look at the, you know, the overall like intentions of the users, right? I, I think users contributing to a a, a repository that is under like GPL and two, but then you know making it a, an extension in some separate form. Uh, they're you know uploading it to to MediaWiki.org. There are lots of different places that people could be providing us permission, depending on how exactly we acquired that uh, that piece of code. Um, I mean, ideally, we have a license file in there that tells us what the, uh, the authors of the code want. But um, if if you're concerned about something, uh, then we should sleuth around to try and find you know what it is, where we got it from, um, what they might have agreed to as part of the process, uh, and ultimately, um, you know, talk to talk to the authors if we need to to get the right permission in place. But yeah, I I, I do see your point. Uh, these contributions are being incorporated inside of a larger GPL. Um, a GPL project, and that's sort of the intention of, of their copyleft clause in the GPL. But uh, unfortunately, the, the the application of that copyleft clause is not uh, not always cut and dry. So we probably need to talk a little more in detail before we just assume it is GPL by, yeah. by the base. Yeah. Definitely, yeah, because we haven't had I, that I know of. Um, fortunately or unfortunately, the the WordPress moment, right, where um, WordPress went through a big discussion with FSLC, et cetera, about WordPress uh, plugins, I think they call them, right, and and their copyleft status um, due to WordPress core. Um, so yeah, that's just a, sorry, teaser really mostly. <laughs> yeah, for, for what it's worth, uh, I think strictly as a legal matter, putting aside the ethical issues, um, that's a, that's a legitimately complex question. I don't think it's as clear cut as WordPress made it sound at the time. Um, so it's something that we could make a good faith 
interpretation either way, so it's a little bit more of a policy question than it is a legal question. Yeah, agreed. And just so it's clear, the extensions that are that I'm referring to are predominantly contributed by staff members or longtime volunteers that have other, you know, GPL v2 contributions in the repository, et cetera. So it's pretty clear socially what the intention is. It's just, you know, the technical legal stuff. But yeah. And, and I, I think it's just important to keep in mind that even if we are, you know, in a sort of legal gray area that is acceptable or we have, a, you know, perhaps a, an agreement from a WMF staffer to release everything they write as part of their job under the GPL, but they just haven't specified that inside of the code, um, you know, that makes us entirely um, in the right under the GPL. But if we're not informing our users of it, then it's not, not very helpful, right? So we still have work to do. <laughs> Any last questions, S, or anybody else? Sure. Um, another thing I ran across was um, I wanted to take a picture of a, I want to take a screenshot of some code in a, in a, one of those online editors. And um, uh, I think it was CodePen. And um, so I was wondering, so the, the code was, you know, freely licensed or whatever, just something that Crinkle wrote, but um, they claimed that their website was copyrighted. So then it's like, well, it's free code, but I wanted to kind of show it running in this cool, cool editor. And I tried tweeting them. They couldn't really tell me whether it was okay to do it. I think they finally said, eh, sure, go for it. But... Um, I don't know. Do you have any thoughts on that? Where where you're sort of taking a you're taking a picture of something that's free, but it's kind of framed within uh, an online editor or a site like um, Flickr or or uh, Google Photos or something? Yeah, um, as a copyright matter, you know the the code that you're seeing inside of CodePen is is freely licensed, uh, but the you know the the license doesn't go into a lot of detail about the copyright status of things generated by that code, um, and it probably shouldn't, right? I mean, we don't need a 15-page license that covers all the eventualities. So, uh, I, I, you know, I think that the the copyright status of the code is probably pretty pretty easy to figure out, though. Um, the the frame around it uh, and could be could be a fair use. I mean, including screenshots of things is a really helpful way to. Uh, inform users about what's going on on the site. Uh, it's being used in a very different way than the uh, than than the site itself. And I doubt you know that that frame is something that they uh, are are worried about protecting. But these are these are all sort of subjective considerations and will depend exactly on your jurisdiction. So um, you know, like legal legal caveats aside, you're probably safe. But if if you're concerned, we can talk more. All right. Fuck yourself, the Apple, my friend. Thanks, thanks everybody for coming to the Tech Talk. Awesome talk. See you next time. Yep.